So welcome everyone. I'm uh, impressed at the size of the audience who came out, took time out of your hacker talk, hacker con to listen to two of us talk about Jim for half an hour. Uh, so we're going to end with that and how you can train yourself up, but I'll start by talking about why and what specifically we're looking to, uh, to train towards for physical red teaming. So we're going to talk about hacking physical spaces with the human body, using the human body for things that it might not necessarily be designed to do or meant to do, and that the physical spaces we occupy were not or did not contemplate within their security model. And then we'll talk about red team fitness and how to train yourself up for it. So brute force, and we'll show you a couple of fun examples of that and how without even any tools you can get through some locked spaces. Fences, climbing, spelunking, speed, rope work, all of that in order to get from the outside to whatever the crown jewels are. So deformation and latching mechanisms and frames. And this is something that we talk about in the physical security village every year in Bypass 101. We've got uh, a, a cool video of it that we're going to be, be releasing this con as well. Uh, particularly double doors with a pole in between the two of them. And we'll see how that works. Lifting heavy garage doors is something you can do as well. So if a building is locked but there's a garage door, oftentimes there's access control on the motor that lifts that up, but there's nothing actually to pin it shut. And so you just reach down and with sufficient force, you can lift the bottom segments of that high enough to roll under and let yourself in. <coughs> pulling a door to the side in its frame, which will then disengage the latch from the frame itself, and lifting and pull it, pulling to unpin double latch door. So we'll, we'll go through all of that. So here, here's the, the image of what happens when you just take a door like this and pull it hard enough. And so you'll see that that post that's between the two double doors actually deforms to the side, and the latch then pops in, because the door is now deformed and it's able to do that. And so just by grabbing the handle and pulling hard enough towards you and using your body weight to support that leverage, you can actually force open a lot of commercial doors of this design with no tools whatsoever. When a door has no center mullion and it's pinned at the top and bottom, very similar things happen except the door bows out when you pull it and that's actually enough to pop out of the frame and pull the door open just by brute force. So this is something that on pest te pen testing engagements is one of the first things we check for is can someone just pull the door hard enough and oftentimes you can and that's, uh, that's a big problem because threat model wise anyone can do it and, and people do. And, and we've worked a bunch of cases where that was actually the case and there was a break in and, uh, and that's how they got in. Climbing is another thing. So often we'll, we'll complain about windows not having adequate locks and they'll say, oh, well, they do on the first floor. Well, the first floor isn't the only thing you have to consider. And so when you have this rustication on the, on the masonry here, that provides a perfect set of hand grips to lift yourself up and get to the second story window. Scaffolding as well, so always be considering construction and what's happening in the transitionary stages of a building. And you can climb up scaffolding even up to a, a, a sec second window or all the way up to the roof. And oftentimes once you're onto the roof, you can get back into the building because that door is now in the exit direction as far as the security was considered. False floors, of course, so, secure, or, or so server rooms tend to use false floors to run the cabling under them, pop that open, slide underneath, and, uh, and access the server room. False ceilings, we'll show you a video of that in a moment. Um, and, and generally, getting around the exterior of buildings as a way to get to the interior in unintended ways. So scaffolding as well, this was... Uh, we're, we're from up in Canada. This was the, the 2019 Raptors uh, celebration in Toronto. And all scaffolding all around the city was completely inundated with people. Um, and so that's something that, that does happen. And of course, you've got a whole lot of distractions for the police if someone wanted to break in during an event like this. So false ceilings. This is something that you're aware of from a bypass perspective <clears throat> that you need to harden that ceiling that someone can pop 
the false ceiling out and climb over. From a red teamer's perspective though, if you want to take advantage of that, you need to be fit enough to do it. And so that involves getting up there, moving it out of the way, not damaging these relatively delicate thin aluminum ceiling brackets, getting yourself up through and over, actually being able to fit through whatever holes there and drop down on the other side. So it takes quite a bit of uh, a physical ability that not a lot of people have to do that. And then just climbing in general. So big beefy gate to, to block out this door, but you can climb over it if you're able to do that. Pipe shafts is another thing. So we do a lot of assessments of offices that are renting out a space in a high rise building with other offices. And if someone can get to your much less secure downstairs neighbor, access a pipe shaft, utility shaft, elevator shaft, whatever it might be from that less secure office, they can then climb up to yours, pop themselves out in a mechanical room, which is deep within the core of your office and have at it from there. But again, from a red team perspective, in order to take advantage of this, you need to be fit enough to squeeze in and scale up. Course fences as well. Fences, I mean, we, the, the, the way over is obvious, so we, we always harp on it that fences keep honest people honest. There's always a way over. In this case, they got the barbed wire right here, but what the hell is this pole doing there? It completely defeats the purpose of that barbed wire, and we'll show you in a minute what, uh, what consequence that has. You can often untie the top squeeze the two parts apart and squeeze through, or even pull up the bottom wire of the fence, which takes some strength to do and you need to be able to fit under it. But if you're able to do that, that's a way past those. So here's a quick video of that. Right, barbed wire fence, but because of that fence post, it completely defeats the purpose of that barbed wire. Brace yourself against the fence post. Don't know why that video didn't finish. Brace yourself against the fence post and climb over, bypassing the barbed wire entirely, jump down the other side. So that was a two, or that was a five second bypass there of this barbed wire fence. And of course, if a fence is properly designed, it does not have a post you can grab. You can throw a, a thick wool blanket over that and, and use the barbed wire to, uh, to support yourself that way. So, so there's ways around it, but you gotta be fit enough to do it. Cases like this, these are common in garages and retail protection. They provide a nice little ladder themselves. It's small, you gotta be able to grab and, and get your toes in there, but you climb up, swing yourself around the top, and that's a way in as well. But of course, you gotta be able to climb and you gotta be able to fit. And so, this is something that, I, I used to be 100 pounds fatter. And so when I was doing red team engagements in that shape, we'd find situations with, fences that you could pull up, there was a gap in the bottom, cases where it abutted the wall of a building, we could pull it apart and squeeze through, or thin gaps like this. And, and on our team, we started calling them fatty filters, because everyone else was able to squeeze through, and then damn Billy has to find some other way around. So uh, I'm, I'm able to get through more of the fatty filters now, but that's something as well that often is just a thin space that you have to squeeze through. Uh, a, a, an interesting example of this, and for those who are not familiar with it, I encourage you to look up the 2015 Clinton State Correctional Facility escape. So this was a, a high profile escape where they used a number of impressive techniques to get out. They popped through the back of their cell into the pipe chase behind it, which supports the plumbing for their toilets, and from there climbed down into the steam tunnels below. And so those tunnels were at times very tight, difficult to squeeze through. You've got to be able to lift yourself, squeeze yourself, and position yourself to get through it. The most impressive part was the escape through the prison wall itself, where they waited until July when the steam was turned off and actually cut into the steam pipe and squeezed through the inside of the steam pipe to get through that eight foot thick concrete wall. And then from within the steam pipe, cut their way out on the other side. And, uh, and there were two, two prisoners that made that escape, uh, one of which did most of the manual labor there while the other did some of the social aspects of it. But, uh, but the second one was a bit more heavy set and he almost didn't make it uh, just because of the diameter of this pipe. So um, 
another thing, thing to think about from a threat modeling perspective when you've got high security correctional facilities for people getting out and similar ideas for people getting in. Um, the, the US military has standards for the maximum diameter of any utility pipe bypassing a secure perimeter for exactly this reason. And so you have to either put reinforced grates across it or split it up into multiple pipes to prevent someone from getting in that way. And then false ceilings as well. This one you get a bit of a leg up because we have a roof hatch ladder right on the one side. So we're popping up there and instead of going to the hatch, climbing out into the attic on the other side. And you see there's a lot of utilities, a lot of sharp things, a lot of delicate, delicate supports to avoid there. Pop the ceiling tile out on the secure side of that door. And then drop our way down. So there's a whole lot of control you have to have over your body and a whole lot of upper body strength to be able to do that successfully. And so ladders in general, you, you see cages trying to prevent you from climbing them without, uh, without unlocking it here. Sometimes they're badly designed and you can just climb the back and it's still just a ladder. But when that's not the case, you've got to be able to climb that cage, which is not particularly difficult to do if you train up for it. And then sometimes it's too far, you don't have enough handholds, and you can do rope work to get up and down. So being able to repel, being able to do a rope ascender is something as well that, uh, that we can use in various circumstances. And then the last relevant aspect is speed. So it does not matter if you set off every alarm if you're gone by the time security arrives. So a couple examples of that happening. These are all, all Apple stores that, that got robbed in, in this case, 12 seconds. Come in, start grabbing things, and then run back out. And now the employees are catching on. Very similar case. 12 seconds, $27,000 take. And so being able to pull that door open, get through, even if you set off an alarm, get to the crown jewels, pull them out, and make your exfiltration successfully. No guard's going to be able to show up within 12 seconds unless they're already on site. And you do see that in most burglaries, is their criminals know to be in and out within five minutes. If they can do that, they're going to evade any security that might respond to them being there. And so being able to do these bypasses, do these forcible entries, do these climbing, whatever you have to do to get in and back out again in a quick period of time is, uh, is important. So now I'll hand it over to Lucas, who's going to talk about how you can train yourself up to be capable of all these things. Hi, so I'm Lucas, and briefly for the second half of this presentation, we're going to be going over the health effects of fitness, uh, the fundamental movements and movement patterns of the human body, and how to do workout planning in order to increase your capacity for red team engagements. So one thing I first wanted to show you was the math of exercise and why it's uh, an important routine to have or add to your daily life. Uh, uh, studies often say that it is recommended to get uh, 75 to 100, or 150 minutes, this is an hour, sorry, 150 minutes per week of moderate to uh, intense to severe exercise. And if you can do that, uh, one minute of exercising at this rate in studies gives you two and a half minutes of additional life. So if you subtract out the one minute that you spend exercising, that's every second you spend exercising, you get an or every minute you spend exercising, that's an additional 90 minutes of bonus life. And you'll be a fit old person as well. Uh, and it's there, I'm not sure about studies that like look at the upper limits of this, but it's pretty hard to overdo it unless you're like basically training as like a full-time athlete. 
So here's the uh, study where I got that math from, if anyone wants to note down the DOI. Um, so what is physical fitness? It is an aggregate of several, several different diverse metrics, including your cardio and aerobic capacity, so how long you can run for and do cardio. Uh, pure strength, so just how much you can lift, even going slow at a slow rate. Uh, power and explosive capacity, so how much you can, uh, like how high you can jump and how much uh, weight you can push very fast in a short period of time. As well as endurance, so how long you can keep doing uh, a certain hard workload for. And flexibility. I've got different examples of all those here on the GIF. Uh, so resistance training is a very important part of physical exercise. In the past, uh, different Olympians and other sports people would just train specifically for their sport because it was thought, okay, if I just do running, I'll just practice running forever. However, uh, it's under the fear that if you spent too much time doing weight training, you'd become muscle bound and too much of an inflexible muscle head who couldn't do anything except for like lift heavy rocks. But most athletes nowadays generally follow a split where they're doing a large amount of resistance training, just generic uh, strength training in the gym, as well as uh, a small amount of a smaller amount of time dedicated to their sports specific training when they're at higher levels. So because of that, uh, a lot of the preparing for the red team uh, physical fitness is just the same as being an athlete, which is uh, doing weighted resistance training. So yeah, there is no muscle bound syndrome and the more weight you can lift and the more strength training you do, uh, that generally increases your flexibility and uh, joint health and many, many other things. And versus in the past, it was worried that if you became too much like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you uh, wouldn't be able to do much else. And here's an example of a famous Greek power lifter named Kyriakos Grizzly. This is a 400 pound man who can do the splits. So just demonstrating that strength and flexibility and uh, cardio are not orthogonal at all. Though there are seven fundamental movements of the human body, according to kinesiologists. There's push motions, so like doing push-ups or the bench press or the overhead press. There are pull motions, like pull-ups. Uh, there's the squat, which involves just knee bending. And then there's the hip hinge, where your knees don't bend at all, but you just lean over this way, so like the deadlift. Uh, there's the twist clockwise as a fundamental movement. And then the TIS anti-clockwise, these both count as two separate ones. And then the last movement is the farmer's carry, uh, <laughs> which to me doesn't seem like a movement. It's just when you're carrying heavy weights and walking like this. But uh, according to kinesiologists, it is. So traditional strength and resistance training is meant to work these seven fundamental movements. So one of the most important ones is the deadlift, which is just lifting a heavy thing off the ground. It involves a ton of back muscles uh, and your entire uh, anterior chain and is mostly a hip hinge motion. Uh, other gym movements include, oops, the bench press, which is our horizontal pressing motion. Oh geez. Uh, the barbell row, which is a pulling motion. So instead of pushing the weight away, we're pulling it away. or pulling it towards us. <laughs> the overhead press, so we have a vertical push motion, uh, and this works the shoulders mainly. Oops. And then pull-ups, which is a vertical pull. So here we've got horizontal push, horizontal pull, vertical push, vertical pull, hip hinge, and squat. And if you just train just these five exercises, this vastly improves your whole body uh, strength and coordination. Because all of these movements are compounds that are using many, many muscle groups. So like, you don't just need to go and just do bicep curls. In this case, doing these heavy compound movements that use many, many muscles and require a lot of coordination improves your overall joint health and strength massively. Uh, and one that I'd like to uh, emphasize importantly is the deadlift. So the deadlift is basically, uh, every time I check and try and remove this from my workout routine, according to size, it, there's just too many positive things it does in such a short period of time. There's basically no other exercise that works as many muscles as the deadlift in a shorter period of time. Uh, it, and even in studies where they try out various different antidepressants and, me, and, uh, and like exercises like running and SSRIs and all of these different things, that in, I've seen various studies where the deadlift just drastically outperforms every other uh, treatment that was applied. Um, it also fixes your grip strength and massively boosts that and your forearm strength. Uh, it completely fixes your posture because on the 
back there, you have all these spinal erectors. So if you're like us and you spend a lot of time at your computer with a with like chronically bad posture like this, the deadlift forces you to snap that up and uh, have a straight back. Uh, it's also good for fixing back pain, despite the fact that uh, it l looks like it would snap your lower back if you don't learn the movements and how to tighten up and stuff. So it does take a little bit to learn the form. But there's basically no other single compound movement you can do that is uh, effective at fixing everything in your body at once. And another one is squatting. I like this article called Squatting is, Essen is Essential as Brushing Your Teeth. So I wanted to read a bit of this. Uh, the deep squat from a joint hygiene perspective is akin to brushing our teeth. We do not simply brush the top one day, the bottom another day, and the side or back whenever we feel like it. We brush every angle of our teeth every day. From my perspective, the deep squat movement is a toothbrush for our joints, ensuring they're all moving without sticky or restricted areas. And I took this stuff a little bit too seriously, because whenever I brush my teeth, I try to do it in a deep squat in order just to multitask. Um, and actually, so this is in, so four years ago, I actually couldn't get into a deep squat like this. Uh, it literally took me like several months of practicing. I'd go down as far as I can without compromising my form. And it took me like two months to even just be able to get down here. So don't worry. All you have to do is keep working at it and every day trying harder to get into that deep squat. Uh, is, yeah. Another aspect is cardio, as you saw from the uh, store or the videos of people hitting the Apple stores. It's very important to be able to run fast. Um, this can take many forms, including jogging, bicycling, swimming, dancing, or whatever makes you personally feel the most comfortable doing it. This also increases your VO2 max, which is how much oxygen you can take into your lungs and how efficiently you can use it. Uh, one aspect of cardio that is beneficial for your health, instead of just doing normal steady state cardio and going jogging for a marathon for hours, it's uh, probably best for your health scientifically to try and do very intense uh, sprints whenever you can. So very high intensity intervals for 30 seconds and then you rest for a minute or two and then do another 30 second all out sprint. The, for, there's a bunch of reasons that this levels up your mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. So, okay. Uh, so that's our general resistance training. The 20% specific training that we want to do in, as red teamers basically focuses around climbing. So this uses a lot of upper back and being able to do a pull up is, is very, very useful for red team engagements because most of the exploits we're doing involve just climbing over and around things. Uh, climbing works a lot of different areas of your body uh, and has a lot of carryover effects to other, other things. Um, and there are lots of ways you can do this, from rock climbing to bouldering, uh, pull-ups, and parkour. Uh, however, one particular item that I'm a fan of is kettlebells, which if I could only have one item for the gym, it would be the, the kettlebell. This, uh, I got really into these during COVID when all the gyms were closed because it's just a tiny, full, comprehensive uh, thing that fits in your closet. So I, like just taking a kettlebell and swinging it up here and catching it at the top is a full body movement that uses basically every single muscle in your body. So just doing repetition kettlebell snatches for 10 minutes a day is a full body workout. You don't need to worry about all these other complicated movements. However, if you're an ultra minimalist and you're stuck in your hotel room, for example, uh, you can't really go wrong with just burpees and bodyweight squats. These are also just full body exercises that don't use any equipment whatsoever that you can do anywhere, just if you're in a prison cell, a hotel room, or et cetera. Uh, going slightly more advanced in the calisthenics area, if you can do dip bars and pull-ups, just doing those are also pretty comprehensive movements. And if you're feeling very advanced, the one arm push up, the one leg squat and handstand push ups are just like the limit of what you can do with just purely your own body weight, no equipment required. Uh, so a note on habit formation, if exercise is not already a part of your life and we've convinced you that it should be, remember that consistency is key. So you just need to pick something that you want to do. Uh, whether that's sports, resistance training, just going on daily walks after dinner or dancing or anything else. Only an ounce of discipline is required to change your life. In this case, most people who go to the gym compulsively don't feel impressed that they do it. They have a habit and it would feel weird for them not to do it. There's only about one brief period of habit formation where they, it's, it's, uh, sorry, where they actually need to apply discipline and do something you don't want.
So yeah, the conclusion is try and get your 150 minutes a week of exercise for maximum life extension, but do whatever is easiest for you to do and maintain consistently. And discipline is freedom. Thank you.